Welcome to the Provocateurs podcast, enabling you to think differently about leadership. Hello, I'm Des Dearlove, and I'm the co-founder of Thinkers 50. And I'd like to welcome you to our podcast series, Provocateurs, in which we explore the experiences, insights, and perspectives of inspiring leaders. Our aim is to provoke you to think and act differently through conversations with insightful leaders who offer new perspectives on traditional business thinking. This is a collaboration between Thinkers50 and Deloitte. So my co-host today is Stacey Janiak, Managing Partner and Chief Growth Officer of Deloitte US. Stacey is also a member of Deloitte's US Executive Committee and Global Board of Directors. Stacey, welcome. Thank you, Des. I am thrilled to be here today to welcome our esteemed guest, Hubert Jolie. Hmm. Hubert is a lecturer at the Harvard Business School and the former chairman and CEO of the consumer electronics retailer Best Buy. He's also a member of the uh, board of directors of Johnson & Johnson and the Ralph Lauren Corporation and a member of the International Advisory Board of HEC Paris, as well as the trustee at the New York Public Library and the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Now, Hubert has been recognized as one of the top 50 management thinkers in the world by none other than Thinkers 50 and received our 2021 Leadership Award. Mm. He's also been ranked as one of the top 100 CEOs in the world by the Harvard Business Review, one of the top 30 CEOs in the world by Barron's, and one of the top 10 CEOs in the US by Glassdoor. Hubert's best-selling and highly acclaimed book is called The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism, which has now been published in French and Chinese and is set to come out in a total of, well, 15 languages so far and growing. Hubert, welcome. Well, thank you so much. And I so look forward to our conversation. And Stacy, thank you for your friendship and your support when I was uh, at, at Best Buy. You and I go, uh, you know, a little bit back. So good to see you. Great to see you and can't wait to get into that story. And congratulations on the book. Um, and if I may so, making, may say so, making the transition from CEO to business thinker and provocateur. <laughs> I mean, it's not always an easy journey. I mean, you go from having all that power and all that stress and all that pressure, and then you kind of have to reinvent yourself. How are you, how are you finding it at Harvard? And would you say there's some sort of thread that runs through your career that's allowed you to, you know, make that sort of transition? And this, it's good to see you. And, and uh, thank you for what you do and what Thinkers50 do to uh, highlight and elevate ideas and help all of us, you know, be better leaders. So very grateful for your leadership in the in the space. I am extremely happy in my next chapter at uh, Harvard Business School as a professor and then outside of Harvard being a, a coach and mentor to CEOs and, and other executives. It's fully in line with my purpose today, which is to, which it's always been, try to make a positive difference on people around me and use the platform I have to make a positive difference uh, in the world. When I was CEO of Best Buy, the platform was Best Buy. Now, I think it may be what I've learned from a leadership standpoint. And so it gives me great joy to help the next, try to help the next generation of leaders, you know, be the best, most beautiful, biggest version of themselves and, and try to make a positive difference in the world, which, which needs it, right? The world is not working well today. So much to do. Well, I want to get into the Best Buy story, Uber. So I, I did have a front row seat to it. It was amazing. But for our listeners who might not know it, I'd love for you to give a brief description of how you came to be CEO. Uh, the company was uh, in a really challenging uh, period at that time. And you didn't have any real retail experience. So why did you take the job on? So it's uh, uh, May of 2012, Stacey, and I get the call from my good friend, Jim Citrin, who is a uh, you know, senior partner at Spencer Stewart, of course, great author as well, um, and uh, he's a great friend. And he calls me about the Best Buy job, and I tell him, uh, Jim, you're crazy, right? I know nothing about retail. And while Best Buy had been a, an amazing leader in the space that I always admired, uh, it's a mess. So uh, you're my friend. Why are you calling me? <laughs> he said, well, they're not looking for a retailer. They have plenty. They, they, they're looking for somebody who can take a fresh perspective. 
and you know effectuate a turnaround. And you're a turnaround guy. That's what you do. So at least do me a favor, study, take a look at it. And whatever Jim tells me to do, <laughs> I end up uh, doing. So I took a look. And it's an interesting lesson because while you know there was zero buy recommendation on the stock at the time, and the media was had written off Best Buy. Everybody thought Best Buy was going to die. And, and as you know, I took the time to to study. So I, I did mystery shopping. I read everything I could. I spoke with alumni. I watched uh, the uh, investor calls of the previous management team, and I saw two things that convinced me that we could do a turnaround. One, the world actually needed Best Buy, and certainly customers for some, at least some of our product purchases. It's helpful to be able to touch, feel, and see the products and ask questions, right? Because this is complex stuff. And then the vendors, importantly, needed Best Buy, right? So, so companies like Samsung and Microsoft, Sony, Apple, they all spend billions of dollars on R&D. And they need to showcase the fruit of these investments. And a box on a shelf at Walmart or as a vignette on Amazon does, just doesn't do it. And so uh, the world needed Best Buy. The second thing is that the companies, of course, had problems, but the good news was that all of the problems were self-inflicted, right? Prices were too high. The online shopping experience was mediocre. The speed of shipping was too slow. The experience in the stores had deteriorated. The cost structure was bloated. What's the good news with self-inflicted problems? We can fix them, right? I didn't need to call Jeff Bezos and say, stop bothering us. We could, we could fix that. So I, I felt that there was enough assets and capabilities and opportunities to effectuate a turnaround. And the, the idea, I was based in Minneapolis at the time, to help to work with others, to help save this iconic Minnesotan company and reinvent it. That was appealing. That appealed to my love for challenges and also my desire to do something good in the world. So, I mean, one of the striking things about the book is that it's not just your, your normal sort of turnaround story about Best Buy. It, it, and it's a very much a personal leadership journey and, yes. dare I say, a, a spiritual journey too. In the book, you talk about the importance of leading with purpose, with a noble purpose and humanity. Can you tell us a little bit about that philosophy? Yeah, and, and maybe I'll, I'll start with uh, describing my journey as a leader, right? Because um, I, I think we all know this. 100% of leaders were born, but none of us were born as a leader. And so there were some important milestones along the way for me. Um, and one of them was 30 years ago. Uh, a couple of friends of mine uh, who are monks asked me to work with them to write an article about the philosophy and theology of work. Why do we work? Is work a punishment because some dude sinned in paradise? Is work something we do so that we can do something else that's more fun, like maybe watching the, the Vikings beat the Green Bay Packers if you're from Minneapolis? Or is work part of our fulfillment as human being? And, you know, part of, you know, a way for us to do something good in, in the world. And of course, that's a choice we have. The sad thing is, of course, in companies, 80% of employees you know, are disengaged, right? So imagine the possibilities if everybody uh, was engaged. So that was a first milestone. The second milestone was uh, about 20 years ago. Um, you know, in many ways, to quote David Brooks, I, I was at the top of my first mountain. I'd been a partner at McKinsey and Company. I was on the executive team of a large media and entertainment company called Vivendi Universal. So I had been successful, except the, the, the top of my first mountain was desolate. There was no joy. There was no meaning. There was no taste. And so call this my midlife crisis. Probably has not happened to you guys, but happens to some of us. And um, probably when I step back, you know, that was coming from the fact that I'd been too driven by the attraction and the seduction of power, fame, glory, or money. And now I know that if it's power, fame, glory, or money, I need to slow down, right? And time out. And so that led me to step back. And with the help of you know, the uh, spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, to revisit my life, you know, the highs and the lows, and try to discern my calling in life. And, you know, key questions my wife and I ask our coaching clients is, how do you want to be remembered? 
right? And all of this led me to your question as to, you know, the realization that, um, and that was, of course, increasingly clear in particular during the, the pandemic, the world as we know it is not working. Right? Well, of course, we have a health crisis, we have an economic crisis. Importantly, we have societal issues, social inequality, racial inequality, environmental issues, geopolitical tensions. The world is not working. And what's the definition of madness, right? Do the same thing and hope for a different outcome. And for me, you know, the, the, there's this need for an urgent refoundation of business, uh, indeed around purpose and, and humanity, purpose and people. The uh, uh, excessive focus on profit that was triggered by this Milton Friedman era is, is very poisonous. Similarly, the, the, if I uh, think about Bob McNamara, who for me is the inventor of scientific top-down management, you know, these things don't work. This is not how you unleash, as I talk about in the book, the, the human magic of your employees in support of a purpose. So it's the idea that you, business is about uh, more than for profits, but doing well by doing it, pursuing a noble purpose, putting people at the center as the, as the source, as the engine, embracing all stakeholders in the declaration of interdependence and treating profit as an outcome, uh, not the goal. Now, of course, most people today believe that, you know, this is the right, something like this is the right direction, but we also all know that this is hard to do. And that's why I wrote this book. And that's why I'm now focused on helping the next generation of, uh, of leaders so that we can all make progress in that uh, direction. And you, as you were speaking, I was thinking maybe business itself needs a midlife crisis. I mean, are we, do you think there's a, there's an opportunity here? It, it feels that the, the, the whole pandemic, that maybe there is this opportunity to, to reset, which is what a good midlife crisis does. It's a, it's, it's a, an opportunity. It's also an imperative because the, the, there's so many, you know, tensions and issues. And what's encouraging, there's, and, and, you know, Stacey, you know, you guys see the same people I see. I'm finding that amongst the CEOs of major companies, both in the U.S., in Europe, I think also in Asia, there is a realization that uh, the old ways are not working and that as human beings, as leaders, and as organizations, we want to do better. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of great examples of, uh, of amazing leadership. The, 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 the model of the leader in this 21st century has changed dramatically, right? The old model of the leader as the superhero who knows everything and tells other people what to do and is driven, again, by power, fame, glory, or money. Eh, nobody wants to follow a leader like this. I think what we're seeing is leaders who are much more purposeful. They, 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 they want to do something good in the world. And then there's some words that come with this, um, that we never used to talk about, you know, when we're talking about leaders, the, the authenticity, vulnerability, uh, humanity, humility, empathy. These are great attributes. And the humility part in particular, uh, so I remember when I was growing up as a kid, you know, uh, there were some, some friends of my parents were visiting and uh, they asked me a question. I said, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. And the person tells me, young man, you, you should never say, I don't know. You're going to lose your credibility. And that was stupid. <laughs> and of course, in this time of great uncertainty, uh, I don't know whether you had the manual to deal on how to deal with COVID or back to the office or the war in Ukraine. Uh, of course, nobody had these things. So it's become super easy for leaders to say, my name is Hubert, and I don't know, and we're going to have to figure this out together. And you're not losing credibility and authority by saying this. In fact, say, not saying I don't know would lead to a loss of, of credibility and authority because people know that we don't know. And so it's a very different approach. And there's so many great examples of this happening in, you know, at all levels in companies. It's very inspiring. Yeah, Uber, I think all the words you just used became really, really relevant during this COVID period. I think you were even ahead of the game as I uh, think about the book and what you described uh, at um, Best Buy around the people-centric turnaround, around the human magic, and 
what I thought was really provocative was that at some point you said you had lost control of the operations, right? And that, I mean, that, that would be, that's very provocative for any leader to get to that point and, and recognize that. Could you talk a bit about what that meant uh, and um, what that meant for the company? It was such a great feeling. Uh, I think it may have been in 2018 and, and, and I'll describe a story that I became aware of. Um, it was, I think it says it was 2018 and, and uh, in a store, in one of our stores in Florida, there was a, a young boy and his mother who came back to the store, the, you know, after the holidays, they, the, the young boy had had for Christmas a, as a gift, he had had a dinosaur toy. And uh, the bad news is that the dinosaur toy, the dinosaur got sick. The way we know the dinosaur got sick is the head got dismantled from the rest of the body, so very sick. And the, the little boy wanted, you know, a cure for the dinosaur. So, of course, they go back to the place where presumably uh, Santa had gotten the, 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 the dinosaur. And, of course, you know, at most stores... You know, you would have uh, been sent to the toy aisle and uh, with some luck, you would have been to buy a replacement. But that's not at all what the little boy wanted. And in that Best Buy store in Florida on that day, there's two um, women associates. It's interesting they were women. Uh, completely understood what was happening. And they took the dinosaur toy. Uh, they went behind a counter and started performing a surgical procedure. <laughs> on the dinosaur, and like in Good Doctor, the, the TV series, they walked the boy through the steps in the in the procedure, and of course substituted a new dinosaur, but gave back to the little boy a cured uh, dinosaur. So you can imagine <laughs> the joy of the little boy and and his mother. Now here's the question: Do you think the, the, the both of you think that at the time there was a standard operating procedure at Best <laughs> Buy on how to deal with sick dinosaurs? Or maybe yeah, even better, <laughs> even better, a letter from me, this very smart CEO on how to deal with this, or perhaps a set of incentives on how many dinosaurs. You, of course not, none of that. These two associates found it in their hearts to create that magic for this little boy. And this was at a time where our comparable store sales, which is a key measure in retail, as you well know, uh, it started to accelerate to a point where it was almost bizarre. It was not rational. And so when I heard that story, and frankly, it was representative of what was happening throughout the company, I said, oh, my God, what have we done? And what we had done is we had unleashed human magic at scale in 100,000 people. And that's when I felt that I said, my God, I've lost control of the operation. And the fun thing is that it had been deliberate because – after the turnaround phase, which was quite different in terms of modus operandi, during the turnaround, of course, the top management team, the CEO in particular, you know, we had had to make a lot of decisions, like deciding to match Amazon prices, invest in e-commerce, partner with the world's foremost tech companies, and, and, and. But in that second phase, uh, which we called Building the New Bloom, which was about growth and pursuing a noble purpose, we said we are... We're not a consumer electronics retailer. We are a company that's there to enrich lives through technology. We had also worked on creating more autonomy at all levels in the company too. Because if, if, if the decisions we made were limited to uh, what the CEO, maybe the executive teams were making, you know, we would become a bottleneck. And so we had created an environment. And that's the key role of leadership in many ways, right? It's not so much to come up with the right answers on the strategy but it's more to be like a gardener to create a fertile soil where all of these human seeds can blossom. And so I had lost control of the operation, Stacey. <laughs> How did you get your leadership team? Because in a retailer in particular, standard operating procedures, very important. That's what people grow up with. How did you get your leadership team to go on that journey with you? Yeah, this was quite an adventure. Um, there was milestones. And, and frankly, you can see on my face a lot of scars, right? That's all of the fumbling and mistakes that we made on the, on the journey. 
um, maybe uh, maybe I can talk about a few milestones. One, uh, so at the beginning of that second phase, right, we had Renew Blue and then building the new blue. We had worked on strategy in that second phase, so segmentation, targeting, positioning, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, but um, this, it went beyond, right? We wanted to know the why. And during one of our offsites, so every quarter we would get the executive team together to work on our plans, our progress, you know, what have you. M most companies do this. And during one of these offsites, I had asked every one of the executive team members to come to the offsite with a picture of themselves when they were little, maybe two or three years old. So as you can imagine, there were some really cute uh, pictures. <laughs> And then over dinner, we spend the evening sharing with each other a life story. You know, the, not our resume, uh, but our life story, the highs, the lows, the struggles, the joys, and our purpose in life. And we discovered two things on this occasion. And by the way, I feel that we don't spend enough time in the corporate world getting to know our team members at that level. So I, I would, that's one thing I would encourage people to consider doing. But we discovered two things. One, every one of the executive team members uh, was a human being. Beautiful, quirky, messy human being, not just a CFO or CHRO or CMO. And then second, with a couple of exceptions, the uh, every member all of us share the same kind of purpose in life, which is to do something good to other people, the golden rule, which I think is, a, is in the heart of every human being. Even Darth Vader, his son believes the force is still in him, right? So even that, so you go. And then we step back and we say, look, we're the leadership team of Best Buy, right? Why don't we use this platform to create an organization that employees will love, Customers will love, vendors, community, and shareholders will love. So all of a sudden, work is back to you know what we've talked about. Work is not just work. It's a calling. It's part of our fulfillment as human beings. It changes everything, I think, in, 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 in the dialogue. And then another milestone in terms of the, this um, unleashing of human magic and, and letting go is that uh, we were working with a, an outside advisor on our effectiveness as a management team. Because we were not happy with our progress, again, too slow. And so we worked on uh, clarity of decision-making. And, um, you know, they, they got me to say, look, uh, there's only three or four decisions I am responsible for. One is the overall strategy for the company, uh, who is on the team, uh, the culture, and big investments, m and and so forth. That's it. The rest, I'm not responsible. I mean, I'm accountable in the end, but uh, somebody else needs to be the lead. So we worked on w how far down we could push decision-making. And then we worked on how the decisions would be made. One of the things that was slowing us down was anytime there was a decision, if a senior executive would raise their eyebrow, you know, like this, it would slow things down. People would freak out. Oh, my God. You know, Jack or Mary, they, they don't seem to be on board. We cannot move forward. And so we said, no, 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 no eyebrow raising. You know, that's not a productive activity. So that's prohibited. <laughs> Maybe in your bathroom, but that's it. <laughs> uh, now, what you can do is, you know, you can, if, if asked or if you want to, you can provide input. So if Jason is in charge, let's say, of the mobile phone strategy, that's one of the things we sell at Best Buy, um, if you have ideas, you can provide input to Jason, but you know, Jason is going to be the decision maker. He's going to assemble a team. We've all moved to agile teams and so forth. And, and so that, and so it's, it's, of course, it's empowerment within a frame. So the frame is that, you know, this is best buy. We have a purpose. We have some, some things that uh, you shouldn't do. Otherwise you go to jail, but then um, you, you have to resist the temptation to over prescribe in the, Last point I would highlight is this. We had, and it's going to circle with the with the dinosaur. We had at some point assembled a team, some of our best people, to uh, come up with the right things to say or ask when selling a TV or a computer or anything like this. And it was really well done, really smart. Except the blue shirts hated it. 
because it took the, their humanity out. It was too mechanical. And given our purpose to enrich life through technology and really what we were to do, trying to do was to be an inspiring friend to our customers. That was really the essence of the strategy. There's no prescription. I mean, it, you cannot prescribe empathy, all right? And so um, it's this tie to the purpose and the strategy and the culture that led us to say, no, we have to let go. Empowerment within a frame. Uh, there's going to be no standard procedure on how to deal with dinosaurs. It's all about, you know, motivation is intrinsic. It's from the inside out. So how do we create that environment where people feel that they can connect what drives them with their work and they have the autonomy and it's all about these human connections. Um, so that was the, that was the work. So I want to take you back to the dinosaur and I want to know two parts to this question. I want to know how did you first hear the story of the dinosaur that needed surgery? So that's the first part. How, where did, where did you get that from? And the second thing is, what do you do as a leader? What do you do with a story like that? Cause that, that potentially that's gold dust when you hear something like that, then how do you broadcast that? How do you, you know, how do you put that into the corporate bloodstream? Yes. There's so stories are such a you know gift because this is how we learn as, as human beings. And, you know, I had this great partnership with our head of corporate communication, Matt Furman. A mistake that companies make, so everybody's working on their corporate purpose, and then they ask the communications team to broadcast it, posters, videos. That's not how people are going to connect uh, with what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, stories are much more powerful. So one of the things that Matt put in place is a mechanism by which he could gather stories from other, outside of the company. So th there was an explicit desire, and he had, you know, told everyone that you know, <laughs> like, give us stories. And anytime he got it, you know, he would then we would make uh, the most out of them in a genuine uh, fashion. Because again, the you know this purpose thing is important. So let's slow down and and, and double click on it. A challenge that companies have is how do you, and we had, is how do you ensure that everybody at the company writes themselves into the story of that purpose? And I think what I've learned is it's inside out. Because imagine for a second that the three of us walk into a Best Buy store and we tell the store general manager and, the, and, and, and his or her team, we have some great news. We have a new corporate purpose it's to enrich life through technology. Aren't you excited? And I can guarantee you that what they're going to say is uh, Uber and Des and Stacy, you, you, you are all amazing. We love you, but we have no idea what you just said, right? This is corporate speech. Could you try again? And I'll give credit to our team. Um, so we had, you know, as we were trying to think through, how do we get everybody to write themselves into the story? We, we assembled a team of 40 or 50 of our best leaders and working with, with some outside help, they, they distilled this idea of corporate purpose to the idea of wanting to be an inspiring friend to our customers, which is something that everybody can relate to. And so one day, uh, we closed all of our stores on a Saturday morning, early, because we love the revenue from Saturdays. Right? And no PowerPoints, no video from the CEO, nothing like this. We got into small groups. Uh, and I was in one of the stores and I was paired with a young woman. Um, she, you know, she had been in an abusive relationship with an ex-boyfriend. She had been homeless. And for her, Best Buy was her home and, and her family. And of course, immediately I see her not as an employee, right? But as a human being, as a beautiful, a bit messy, uh, but big uh, human being. And then the second thing we were asked to do was um, uh, to share with each other the story of an inspiring friend in our life. And for me, it's my older brother, Philip. He's an amazing guy. He is the guy you should be interviewing. He's way better than I am. <laughs> and and sen then what we said is, look, what we're trying to do, uh, which we already do, by the way, when we are at our best, is to treat each other and the customers as human beings not a walking wallet, and treat each other and the customers as if we were an inspiring friend to them. Now, everybody 
can relate to this, can connect to that, because we, you know, hopefully everybody listening has an inspiring friend. If not, you know, call call, call us after class, <laughs> so that we can we can help you. Now, of course, we've all gone to training. It's not sufficient to go to a training. So then you need to create the right environment, uh, you know, for that these seeds to 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 blossom. And stories to go back to your question does help make it come to life. Uh, and then standard operating procedures, Stacey, you know, uh, at some point, Cami, our head of HR, you know, Cami said, uh, do you know what SOP stands for? It's not standard operating procedure. It's service over policy. And early on, when I studied at Best Buy, we created a new policy. So uh, I'm going to take about 15 minutes to read it uh, to you. Uh, and the policy was like this. It was... Um, we shouldn't do anything that's either stupid, crazy, or goofy. End of policy. I like that. I'm sure the blue shirts like that. Yes. <laughs> that's empowerment, right? So if you see something, do something. So that was avoiding to make you know, mistakes at the beginning. And then in the second phase, which was more about being this inspired friend, stories like the dinosaur, Stories also on how we dealt with Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, you know, really helped uh, the culture come to life. You know, the, the, we had three stores on the islands. And of course, they had been hit. You know, the island had been destroyed, by, as we all remember. And we couldn't, get, we couldn't contact our employees. You know, somehow the U.S. government decided that uh, the Navy couldn't help, right? It's an island. Maybe the Navy could help. And so Amber Kales, who was the regional manager, uh, you know, we um, told her, Amber, do whatever it takes. And so she um, chartered some private flights. And at some point she asked, how do I do this? Do I charge that on my credit card? You know, there was no SOP for that. And, you know, we shipped goods, we shipped cash, we brought people back from the island. Of course, like many other employers, we continue to pay the employees for as long. The only ask was that they should contribute to the rebuilding of the island. We paid them until we reopened the stores. If people wanted to move to the mainland, we could do this. So it was a case of whatever it takes, because this was our people. We were going to take care of them. And we never broadcast that on national television and so forth. But internally, this, this is who we are. Let's let's take another provocative topic, one that's very topical at the moment, and talk about employee activism. I mean, this is a this is clearly a growing area, and I know you're not in the CEO hot sort of seat anymore, but you have been, and you you have experienced some of these things. I mean, is it still okay for companies to sort of sit on the fence and remain apolitical, or or should they get involved in? you know, sort of the politics of the day and the 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 social campaigns of the day. Yeah, this is the, uh, I'm, I'm quite close to CEOs. In fact, uh, earlier this week at HBS, we did a, um, uh, we have an ongoing program with a, um, a bunch of CEOs from the US and Europe uh, where they bring their toughest leadership challenges and this issue of engaging in societal matters is one of their top two or three uh, issues. The, uh, <laughs> We've all seen uh, the case of Bob Chapek saying, no, I'm not going to get involved into politics. Or somebody else could say, I'm going to get involved, but not in political matters. And you say, it cannot be. And, and so, you know, the, if you look at the last five years, there's been this growing need of an expectation of companies getting engaged in societal matters, in part because there's more of them, in part also because governments around the world have been failing or have been reluctant to, you know, uh, weigh in or have failed to weigh in uh, and, and solve some of these issues uh, appropriately. The, the challenge, of course, is that the, the companies, you know, as CEOs, we're not elected officials. So when I was CEO and the CEOs I know, they know they're not president of the of the country. They cannot get involved in every issue. So you have to be selective and based on your purpose and your values and your stakeholders. And then um, figure out what's the best way to uh, to get engaged uh, and 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 be effective because it's one thing to speak up, um, but you also want to be you know effective, 
And so I see companies developing criteria, resources, processes, boards need to get involved to review the, the framework, you know, what are the topics in which we're going to weigh in um, and develop a set of internal and external capabilities because so many of the topics are new. You know, many CEOs, you know, probably struggled on how to spell Ukraine up until a few months ago. Uh, or you ask, you know, I've written a case with uh, my good friend Bill George on the Georgia voting rights uh, bill. Mm-hmm. Most CEOs are not experts mm-hmm. at uh, this issue. And at the same time, you know, let's think about it. We have employees, right? And if somebody is attacking, we feel the rights of our employees, that's an issue. Now, you know, you can debate whether it's actually effective to get publicly involved in the debate or whether it's better to do it behind the scene or whether, you know, your best approach is to actually act. So Carol Tomei, the CEO of UPS, you know, she didn't speak up publicly much about the issue, uh, but which she, she acted. So uh, giving PTO, give, give it, as you know, I wanted to speak to an international audience. So in the U.S. election day is on a Tuesday. And if you are a part-time worker, you know, if you go vote, you, you're going to, you know, miss the, re- the, the, the revenue opportunity. And if you're going from paycheck to paycheck, that's an issue. And if you have to wait in line for five hours, that's a big deal. So many companies have given a day off on the day of election days. Maybe they've put voting machines, you know, on the, uh, closer to their uh, premises. They educate, they make it easier for people to register and so forth. Why does it matter? It matters for two reasons. One, you want to have the back of your employees. And B, there is a view that democracy is a key and critical foundation for business. And so, uh, you know, if you want to democracy to, to work, you want people to, to actually vote. So, um, you know, decide to not get in, engaged in political matters on your own peril. But then be selective, be thoughtful. I think that you need to pick issues that are relevant to you, where you're going to be authentic, where you're going to be legitimate, where you've done the work. You're going to be, need to be congruent because if you say something externally and your practices internally are terrible, that's not a good thing. You need to look at how to be effective in your actions. And then you need to understand the business impact, but not necessarily let the business impact drive the outcome because your values may be more important than the business impact in the short term. So something like Black Lives Matter, is that something that, the, I mean, it, it seems to me that, that everybody has to have a position, has to have a voice and, and something like that. That's not one that you can sort of sidestep. That, that's a critical one. Uh, and uh, there I'll talk from a, a U.S. perspective because the issue of ethnic, uh, racial inequity, they, they vary by country. There's Issues in every country, but the, the Black Lives Matter is a, is a U.S. Um, specific. I mean, with slavery, right? Um, I think every company now realizes that uh, having a team, an organization that reflects the customers we serve and the communities in which we operate is is not only a moral imperative; it's also a business imperative. And I think in the U.S. there's been this long history of inequality unfairness, uh, and, and so forth. And companies for many years were talking about it, but not really getting traction. And I think now there's a widespread realization that this is a, a business imperative. And, and uh, I remember sitting down with Melody Hobson, who, of course, is uh, a co-CEO, now CEO of Aerial Investment, and then chair of the Starbucks board, who told me, Hubert, do you know that uh, you know if you go to the bathroom in a hotel, and if your skin is very dark, you're not going to be able to get soap from the uh, infrared activated soap dispenser. Everybody in the black community knows this, but you don't know this, right? Because you're not black. And so if you're running a hotel company, you'd better have some black people on the team. Same with smartphones. We all know that smartphones for years struggled with taking pictures of black individuals because it was infrared uh, activated. So this is a, a business imperative. And the, the good thing is that once you realize it's a business imperative, in the business world, we know how to deal with business problems. And we simply need to apply the same kind of rigor 
So if you're not able to recruit black employees, well, are you fishing in where the fish is, right? Uh, or if, if people are not, you know, uh, if they apply, but they're not selected, do you have the right interviewing teams? We've observed that uh, diverse slates and diverse teams is what lead to good outcome. Diversity is one thing. Inclusion is another thing. You know, are you retaining and promoting people? Have you built a place where everybody feels that they belong? And uh, that's a critical thing also, by the way, for me, back to the human magic thing. You know, if the employees don't feel that they can be themselves and, and belong, you, you're going to miss. And I remember, and I'll finish with this, I remember uh, when they're visiting a store, speaking with a young associate, he, he told me his life changed the day a manager recognized him and took an interest in him. Then he became, he had the opportunity to grow and to become the biggest, best, most beautiful version of himself. So the, the leadership implication there is, uh, so my compatriot, René Descartes said, uh, I think, therefore I am. No, he's wrong. I'm sorry, long time ago. It's I am seen, therefore I am. As leaders, we need to make sure we create an environment where everyone feels that they are seen and that they matter and that they, they are a key member of the team. Tell me about the reverse mentoring scheme that you have at Best Buy, because that, that was it's just a nice thing that you it's such a it's such an easy thing to do. And it, I think it goes to the heart of some things you're talking about. And it's something that people can take away from this podcast and just, you know, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So Laura Gladney, actually, I, I saw her yesterday because she was in a program here at uh, Harvard Business School that Linda Hill has put together for women of color. And uh, Linda, uh, Laura was uh, in the program because I, I made sure that she would be. So when we started to put more emphasis deliberately uh, um, on um, uh, diversity, in particular as, as relates to the black community, after I realized, uh, after seeing the employee engagement surveys and the differences across ethnicity that our black community was really suffering, the, I, I'll give credit to the HR team of having established this, uh, they called it reverse mentoring program, she was my mentor. Let's be clear. There was no reverse. <laughs> she was my mentor. And, you know, I didn't grow up in this country. So my exposure to the history of the black community in this country was limited. But frankly, most of the white people in this country did not grow up, you know, in black communities. So it's not just, you know, if you're foreign born. And this was such a gift because, frankly, I had so much to learn. And Laura, bless her heart, was so kind in you know, sharing her life story with me, how her great grandmother had been a slave uh, and uh, how the community she grew up in uh, that's between Minneapolis and St. Paul called Rondo had been destroyed when we had the freeways, right? This country in the 50s, we built all of these highways and freeways and many times they went through black communities, destroying black communities or separating black communities from white communities. And uh, she also educated me. I, I remember, and I, I shared that with her this week. In one of my first meetings, I said, actually, Laura, I don't see you as a black person. I see you as a human being. And her response was, are you, are you blind? You know, I am black. You know, I hope you see me as a black person because, you know, I have my black heritage and I want, to see, I want you to see me. And the reason why many of us attempted to say I don't see you as a black person because we try to be very inclusive, but that's some... That's a mistake. I, there's no denial. She's black. So let's see her as a wonderful, beautiful, amazing, you know, black woman uh, with a wonderful family and aspirations and so forth. So we talk about the heart of business, right? This is connection uh, through the heart and building these human connections. Human connections are the heart of business between the employees, between the employees and the customers. Shareholders, they're human beings. All of this life is about these human connections. And uh, this mentoring program helped me on that dimension. That's fantastic. Stacey, I'm going to leave the last question to you because we are running, um, we, we're going to run out of time, but I'm sure you've got another question up your sleeve. I do. So, Hubert, for our listeners, I mean, you, you have charted a really provocative path. And what what last piece of advice would you have someone who's trying to emulate that, who wants to be their own provocateur? Ah, yes. 
and the French do have a French word for provocateur, right? <laughs> I, I think, Stacey, maybe it's this, right? During COVID, when we couldn't go outside, we had to go inside. And uh, for every one of us, you know, slowing in this very uncertain and sometimes scary uh, world where it's hard to predict, you know, what, uh, what's going to happen and, and we're clearly not in control of most of it. Going inside and spending time with ourselves, reflecting on, you know, who we are, what kind of a leader we want to be, how do we want to be remembered? We have a way to talk about our purpose in life. What are our key values? I think with this bunch of CEOs I was with earlier this week, we said in this time of uncertainty, it's about purpose, principles. I, there's a lot I don't know, but what are the key principles that are going to guide my actions? And then it's about doing my best. My, you know, a good friend, Marshall Goldsmith, who's been my coach for many years, he says I'm his most improved client, which shows that if you start low enough, you know, you can be the most improved. His advice to his friends and clients is, um, you know, either it's every day or every week or every month, you know, spend time with yourself and ask yourself, did I do my best today or this week or this month to be the kind of leader I wanted to be? Not was I perfect, but did I do my best? And if I didn't do my best today, be kind with yourself because there's always tomorrow. So in other words, Go inside, slow down, define who you want to be, what you want to work on, what's going to be important to you, and then meet regularly with yourself to see whether you're doing your best and how you can get better. That I, I don't know it qualifies as advice because who am I to give advice? I don't know, you know who is listening. But certainly that's a practice that uh, has been helpful to me. Fantastic. So the book is The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism, and we thoroughly recommend it. Um, and it's, it's available. It's going to be shortly will be available in 15 languages. Um, Hubert, you talked a little bit about the future there. What's what's next for Hubert Jolly? What, what, what are you doing next? Are you going to work on another book? <laughs> I think at some point I may create a field manual, manual for the heart of business. In the meantime, you know, my passion, my main activities are here at uh, HBS, helping the next generation of, uh, of leaders uh, designing. In fact, that's my next meeting, a new program that we'll have available next year in, in June called uh, Growing Purposeful Leaders. So it's for senior leaders who've, who've mastered a lot of technical capabilities and are ready to move on to the next stage and, and uh, trying to equip them with what it takes to lead in this crazy uh, uh, world. And uh, so that's my passion. It's, uh, it's really helping the next generation of leaders become the best, uh, most beautiful version of themselves they can be. The world needs them to be that way. If you're leading a company today at any level, it's, it can be daunting, but it's also a huge opportunity to make the, a, a, a big difference on people's lives. So that's my passion. Yuba, thank you, and thank you for being a provocateur with us today. And Stacey, thank you too. Um, that's, I'm afraid, all we've got time for, but um, please do check out Hubert's work. He writes regularly for the Harvard Business Review. And are there other places people can get can find you? Well, thank you both. Yes, uh, I, I, they can go to LinkedIn, my profile, so it's easy to find Hubert Jolie. I also have a website, hubertjolie.org, uh, um, and they can also email at uh, hjolly at hbs.edu, which is uh, you know, where Professor Jolie, as my students call me, resides. You know. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Well, join us again soon for another another in the series of provocateurs. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah.